Hello, James Aketty here. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Juneteenth and the abolition of slavery on this June 19th, 2020. Um, so as you're all probably familiar, Juneteenth is a holiday commemorating uh, the arrival of Union troops in Texas uh, to enforce the uh, emancipation of enslaved people in that former Confederate state. Um, a couple things to understand about this. First of all, uh, the reason why it's a matter of enforcing as opposed, like, the reason why we think of it this way, that the troops arrive and they can enforce the law, um, is because, technically speaking, the uh, enslaved people in Texas were freed um, on January 1st, 1863, as a result of Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. Um, but I, I want to clarify this because some people have confusion. I've seen confusion online about this. Um, the Emancipation Proclamation does not end slavery in the United States, right? Um, the Emancipation Proclamation, which was originally issued in 1862 with January 1st, 1863 as the kind of date that it would come into effect, um, abolished slavery in the states still in rebellion. Okay, so the theory was that if you were still in the Confederacy and hadn't, hadn't um, uh, uh, you know, given up yet, um, or hadn't been conquered yet by January 1st, 1863, um, then all of the enslaved people in that territory would be considered free in the eyes of the United States government. Um, now you might wonder, well, why does that make any sense? Because of course, Lincoln didn't control the states that were still in rebellion. That's the whole point of the fact there was a rebellion. So what impact would that emancipation have actually had? Well, it was twofold. Um, one thing was that Lincoln wanted to uh, kind of coax the, the states back in uh, uh, to the Union to sort of give up and, and rejoin the Union. If they did so, under the terms of the Emancipation Proclamation, they would have been able to keep slavery. Right? So if Texas had given up, uh, belonged to the Confederacy in you know, November of 1862 and had come back into the Union you know, at, at its own request, uh, they would have been able to hold on to slavery at least until the 13th Amendment passed, you know, but, or, or was ratified, which was much later, and that process hadn't even been initiated yet. Um, the other reason was uh, because of runaways, right? I mean, slave people were running away in huge numbers, and this was causing um, what uh, Dr. W.B. Du Bois, in his 1935 book, Black Reconstruction, what he called a general strike of enslaved people who were uh, just running away in droves um, and causing a shortage of labor and uh, by encouraging enslaved people from the South to run away, uh, by promising them freedom if they arrived in the North, you know, they're already free, but they have to get to a place where their freedom is actually enforced, um, this would, you know, trigger more uh, runaways. Okay, so um, the other thing about this, of course, is that upon the arrival of Union troops in Texas, you know, the Emancipation Proclamation covered the state of Texas because they never ended, ended the rebellion. Um, and so that meant that enslaved people in Texas were technically free. The 13th Amendment wasn't ratified until December of 1865, months later, right? So, so still, you know, th this is not the end of slavery in the United States by any means. This is one particular important symbolic moment in the history of, of, of uh, abolition. But I think this lends itself to a bigger conversation about what abolition actually means, right? Um, Here's what it boils down to. Slavery was a system, right? Slavery was a system. So abolition was a process. You know, slavery was a system, abolition was a process. It wasn't just a moment. It wasn't like, even when the 13th Amendment was ratified, it's not like, you know, you snap your fingers and then all of a sudden slavery's gone. No, it's not. A, you can't really pinpoint a date of the end of slavery if you want to be really serious about it, because you're talking about a system which had to be dismantled. And of course, it had to be dismantled on the basis of the different components that constituted that system. So let's look at some of those, right? I mean, the, you know, when people think of slavery, very often they think you're, you're working, you're not getting paid for it, right? Um, this is a very limited understanding of what slavery actually is, though. I mean, let's just take even the most basic forms of slavery. One thing is, you know, slavery is a, is a labor system, right? And in the United States, it was a labor system where the apparatus of the state, which was underwritten by violence, uh, exercised control over labor, right? I mean, the law treating human beings as chattel, right? And having, you know, a legal system built around that, this is part of using the apparatus of the state to underwritten by violence in order to permit and create the conditions for coercive labor under a system like slavery. So, you know, to what extent was that apparatus dismantled? 
Well, I mean, you know, from even the most basic history of this, that initially through the black codes, which were very short lived, but initially through the black codes and later through the use of contracts um, to tie people to land, the use of sharecropping um, and kind of indebtedness to tie people to land, the use of uh, convict leasing, right? Uh, to funnel people into the criminal justice system and then disperse them um, through the payment of, of, their, of their debts by, by landowners. Um, onto the you know the, the farms and the mines uh things like the chain gangs and eventually even things like the the leveraging of poverty and desperation um uh to get people you know to to do to do labor um you know you can't really talk about 1865 as the end of that at all right i mean even just taking the example of convict leasing you know evidence of this goes all the way into the 1930s and if you want to talk about sharecropping you're talking about into the mid 20th century you still have sharecropping. Um, and in as much as these are institutional legacies of enslavement, um, you can't really talk about abolition ending, you know, all the facets of slavery. But that's only one component. Take another one. Um, you know, another big part of slavery was that enslaved people couldn't own land, right? You know, land isn't just about, oh, I have a place to live and whatever. If you're a farm worker, land is economic independence, Right. This is you use your labor on the land you own and you get. Right. So if you don't own the land, uh, you can't really be truly independent because you have to deal with whoever you're working for and you work on their terms. Right. Um, which is, of course, what sharecropping was and why it was so destructive. The other thing about land, of course, is it, it enables generational wealth. Right. Like you work on the land and it becomes valuable and you have a farm, whatever you pass it on to your children. You know, um, or even th something like today. You know, you work for 30 years to pay off a mortgage and then you sell your house or whatever and buy a smaller house and you help your kids buy a house with you know, money. I mean, this happened. My, my, my parents uh, bought their first house with the help of their parents. You know, this capital is coming from somewhere. Of course, it, it's ultimately rooted in, in land um, and goes back to the original acquisition of land. If you don't have land, right, you don't have a mechanism for the transference of generational wealth. OK, so this is part of the system of slavery, too, is that every generation is sort of made to start again. Right? There's no building to be done. Um, in that sense, you know, land wasn't really distributed. This was part of the theory of Reconstruction was you were going to redistribute land. It doesn't actually happen. Um, the Freedmen's Bureau, which was called the, uh, the Bureau of, uh, I believe it's Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, was I think the full title. Um, you know, part of the theory is that they were going to take the abandoned lands of you know, former Southern slaveholders, and they were going to give them to, uh, uh, give it out to formerly enslaved people. It didn't happen, though. Right. Um, this this part of it was killed. So that doesn't happen. Land doesn't happen. Um, you know, another element of slavery, of course, was that, again, the system is underwritten by by violence. Well, so what about protection from violence, protection from state violence, protection from vigilante violence? Surely you couldn't really say slavery was abolished if you live in a society where violence of the vigilante or state variety can still be used to exercise control over people specifically to, to make them labor. Um, well, I mean, even a passing glance at the, the better years of Reconstruction, right, when a kind of, you know, radical social reorganization was, was being attempted, you know, terroristic violence by white supremacist groups in order to subjugate formerly enslaved black people was a regular part uh, of that era and, of course, of the eras since, um, you know, at greater or lesser times, depending on when you're looking at. Um, but we never really developed, uh, a, uh, through concerted efforts, um, a cap on that or a, a kind of limit, limiting um, counter apparatus right, against that, that apparatus of violence. Um, another thing about this, of course, is unequal social relations, right? Um, and social and political relations. So let's look at a couple things. I mean, you know, you need to have equality under the law. Right. I mean, enslaved people were rendered legally as property. And so when the UN slavery, you know, just abolishing slavery doesn't actually get rid of the fact that people aren't citizens. They don't have any rights. So theoretically, the 14th Amendment, um, which, you know, creates birthright citizenship and, and, and creates equality before the law, um, uh, th this this should have done this. But of course, that required enforcement. Right. And so you can be a citizen on paper, but that doesn't necessarily mean that your rights are being protected actively. Right. Or indeed that those who are attempting to violate your rights are being stopped from doing so in any kind of serious way. Um, again, during Reconstruction, there were partial victories here. And you, at least you get this thing on the books, 1868, 14th Amendment. But it's not going to, you know, the, the effect isn't to completely 
you know, um, grant actual social and political equality um, for black people by any means. And of course, in terms of political equality, you still don't have the vote, right? Part of slavery is that, you know, black people aren't considered, you know, uh, people legally and so don't, aren't political entities. Um, well, 15th Amendment, 1870, right? Black men get the right to vote in the constitution. So even in the best of times, half of black people can't vote and, and, and wouldn't technically be able to vote until 50 years later. And even then very few would be able to, uh, black women. Uh, but of course, you know, the, the ability of black men to vote was countered again by terrorism and white supremacist violence. And while for a few years in reconstruction, um, this was countered forcefully, um, you know, by, by Grant. I mean, it doesn't last. And of course, if you move forward for the, in, the, in the following decades, um, it was very easy for white supremacists to use violence to deter uh, black people from voting. And by the way, you don't even have to have someone show up at every polling station with a gun. Um, you know, if a handful of people are murdered in some kind of grisly, horrible act of racial antagonism, um, that's going to dissuade a large number of people from voting. And I mean, you move forward, go go a hundred years into the future and, and look at the, at the uh, sort of circumstances of the Selma March, and we'll see that, you know, the use of vigilante violence to prevent voting, even after the Voting Rights Act is passed, uh, you know, it's not like people all have a, a equal access to the vote. And today, of course, things like the closure of polling places and the rest of it is part of a long history of trying to prevent the exercise of political power by black people, right? Um, so, you know, and, and I guess you know, if we want to look at any bright spot here, I mean, one thing that was a part of the slave system that was undone in, in large part was the prevention of education. Remember, it was illegal in most places to educate enslaved people, teach people how to read and write, do math. Um, the Freedmen's Bureau, you know, one of their great successes was the creation of an of, uh, a, a education system um, which did educate a large number of enslaved black people in Reconstruction. And even after that, that uh, the Freedmen's Bureau itself kind of fell apart, um, you know, the education component did did remain effective in, in at least in a sense. Um, you know, so that one part, the prevention of getting an education, that one part was partially addressed, but there again too. I mean, fast forward a hundred years and look at the um, controversy around school segregation and of course the quality of schools and look at our own community around Boston um, and the busing crisis. I mean, that, that too, these are legacies of institutional inequalities around this question of education, which goes back to a question that emerged out of slavery, which is that black people were not able to, to learn. Um, right. So, I mean, thinking about all these things, it's really important for us to recognize that slavery was a system, so abolition was a process. Um, and when you look at a lot of the circumstances facing the black community in America today, I mean, these are historical outgrowths of the failure of abolition or the sort of non-complete project of abolition. Um, and so for that reason, on this Juneteenth, I think it's worthwhile to think about this history and to try and, and um, reckon with that um, and, and understand what, what it means for us in 2020 uh, to celebrate uh, the events of 1865. And, and I, in my opinion, the best way that we can do that is to ensure uh, that we are continuing the process of this fight for freedom, for total freedom. Um, and not merely sort of self-congratulatory patting on the back and all that. I, I think this is really quite useless. Um, it's important for us to reckon with the ways that abolition was successful and the ways that it was unsuccessful. And unfortunately, the latter category is much larger, right? So while, yes, you know, chattel slavery in the United States of the sort that existed pre-1865 is history, but that in no way means that slavery was successfully demolished or successfully abolished. I know it seems kind of confusing and I think people struggle with this, but this, this is the reality. Um, abolition uh, is an incomplete project. Um, also remember when we use the word abolition, which of course we're talking about now in the context of prison abolition or police abolition, here too, this has never ever ever been a matter of the stroke of a pen or of a particular law, right? This is a matter of radically reimagining how society works 
right? Those who advocate for prison abolition or police abolition aren't saying keep everything the same, but just get rid of the police stations and the prisons. That that's that nobody proposes that. The point here is to radically reimagine, transform society in a way such that these institutions are, are no longer a part of the system, but were obviously, you know, people's concerns about safety and order and the rest are still addressed. Um, uh, and of course, of, of justice. So th that's all. I just wanted to I'll offer some thoughts, and if you have any, you know, you feel free to comment or whatever, but uh, that's it for me.